Hello and welcome to Production Bytes Reviews. I'm your host, Veronova, and today I'm going to be reviewing UBK1 by Kirsch Audio. UBK1 is what the makers call a movement generating character compressor. And what this means is it's not a compressor or dynamics processor designed to be transparent. Instead, it's designed to make a really big impact on the sound and sound musically pleasing. UBK1 is made up of three stages. There's a saturation control, a compression stage, and a density stage. So I'll take you through the signal chain and just explain a bit about what each stage does. When sound first comes into the compressor, it comes through the headroom control, which is just another name really for a gain control or a trim control. Except in the case of this, unlike a gain, if you turn it up, the input gain comes down, and if you turn it down, the input gain goes up, so you'll get more level. Now it's laid out like this to encourage you to make the most of your headroom and get a signal as loud as possible without clipping. So there's a light here called Ample, which will light up when you have good signal coming through, and this None light will show up when clipping occurs, so it means no headroom. After the headroom control, it goes on to the saturation stage. And this stage is pretty simple, you just turn up the pot until it sounds good. This stage also has a bypass control, which is the VU meter, and it has a mix control. So you can have the mix all the way dry, so the saturation stage isn't affecting the sound at all, or all the way wet, so all you're hearing is the saturated signal, or any point in between. And the programmers have also put in a number of presets for what they think are good settings to use in the mix. The next stage is the compression stage. Now up here, you'll see you've got a high pass control. And what this does is not high pass the signal itself, but it high passes the signal that the compressor sees. So it's what the compressor uses to decide how to compress the actual signal. This means if you've got a rather boomy low end on something, then you can just high pass that off and compress using the more stable high end. That way you don't get any sudden dips in volume when a boom comes along. And this is useful when compressing anything from vocals to drums, because in vocals you'll get plosives sometimes, and you don't want your compressor to suddenly push down hard on the vocals because your vocalist had a plosive. These switches switch between a number of different compression algorithms, which are based on a number of different hardware units. So each one of these is a different compressor. And this does mean that this compressor is pretty powerful in terms of shaping the sound because there are so many different ways to compress the audio just at the compression stage. Again, you've got a mix control just like in the saturation stage and this works exactly the same, allowing you to blend between a dry signal and a wet signal at the compression stage. The VU meter is also a bypass switch as with the saturation stage and of course your compression control allows you to control how much compression is being added. So moving on to the density stage. Now Kirsch Audio don't really explain exactly what this does, but judging from the curbs they've put up here on one of the controls, I would guess that it starts with an EQ, which boosts a set of frequencies and then allows you to compress the signal. But even if that's not what it does exactly, it does do what it says and it does appear to thicken up the frequencies. Also in the density section, you have a bypass switch again on your VU meter. And finally, at the end of UBK1, you have a master out volume control. So without further ado, I want to show you some of the tests I've done. So the first thing I've got here is the drums bus from one of my tracks. And I've taken off all of the bus processing effects and anything that was on the master channel. So this is just a clean drums bus export. And that sounds like this. So as you can hear, those drums sound pretty nice. They're nice and punchy and pretty fast paced. And there's already a little bit of pumping in the cymbals from the way I've compressed them. But let's see what I could do with UBK1. So if I turn this on, the first thing I'll be doing is setting my headroom control. Okay, so you'll see I pulled up the headroom until it started to clip and then I backed it off a little bit. 
I can see here that there are peaks and they're pretty regular because the samples are already quite compressed. So I can afford to give myself a small amount of headroom really, as there isn't any chance of louder peaks coming through at any point. So the first thing to do really, is if I bypass these, I'll just work on the saturation stage. Okay, so you can hear that when I turned it all the way up you could hear some significant distortion in the kick drum. So I backed it off from there to a point which I think sounded pretty nice, there isn't really any distortion at this point. It's just giving the drums a nice little push. And switching between the dry and wet mix, you can hear it does make a big difference to the overall power of the mix. And I actually think that this preset here sounds pretty good, which is 70% wet mix. And I think that does give the cymbals quite a nice lift without detracting from the transients and the kick and snare at all. So let's move on to the compressor now. So I'm going to start with my compressor high pass all the way down. And if I hear any problems, then I'll start dragging it up again. And at the minute, I've got the compressor algorithm set to crush. And I'll just turn this on. And let's have a little listen to this. Now you can hear as I sweep through the compression range there, that everything changes several times and that's because this is an all-in-one compression control. So it's potentially affecting the threshold, the ratio, the attack and release settings and the output gain as well. So you heard around here, there was obviously a fairly fast attack because transients weren't really getting through. But then when I started to turn it up more, the attack opened up a bit and you could hear the transients again. Okay, so as per the name of that, it does sound like it's crushing the drums quite a lot. So let's try some other algorithms and just see how they sound on it. So you can hear there, that's really compressing quite hard now. And it's pushing down a lot around when the transients hit, which is making the cymbals pump a lot, and it's giving quite a nice groove there. But of course you've lost all of the power of the drums now, it's just groove. So this is where the mix control comes in, and if I turn that all the way to dry, then I can start working it up until it's just adding something to the mix. So compared to the original mix now. And again, that's still sounding rather crushed. It's a bit more crushed than I would like, but that sounds good. And I'm just gonna have a run through some more of the algorithms just so you can kind of hear what they do.
and that one sounds really nice on these drums. So it's good just to have a flick through these algorithms and just see what sounds good. I'll just move over to the last one so you can hear that. And again, that's quite nice, but I think if I was actually doing a mix here, I would probably go for smooth, because that had a really nice pumping but also punchy sound to it. And finally, you've got the density control, which, to be honest, in the time I've used it, I haven't found it sounded particularly good when I'm using it in conjunction with the saturation and compression. But it can add a lot to a track if you just use it on its own. So I'm going to use it on its own for this, I think. So you can't really hear what it's doing so much on drums, you can hear it's compressing, but in terms of how it's different from a compressor, it's not so easy to hear. I can definitely hear that using the top setting does add a little bit more to the cymbals, but it doesn't really show so well on drums. So just briefly, since I've already been doing drums, I'm going to have a little play with this drum sample here. Okay, so that's quite a groovy sample. And if I put UBK1 on, then I'll have a little play with this and just see what sounds I can come up with. Okay, so that sounded quite groovy now, if I just have a listen back to that with it disabled. So that definitely makes a difference to the overall groove and feel of the drum track. So again, moving on, here I've got some vocals. When the bridges break and the mass are calling for a better place. So you can hear that's quite rocky. It would benefit quite well from some saturation, I think. So let's try putting that on. And first I'll start by setting my headroom as usual. I'll need to give myself a little more headroom than normal though, as the dynamics of this vocal track are a little all over the place. When the bridges break and the mass are calling for a better place. When the bridges break and the mass are calling for a better place. When the bridges break and the mass are calling for a better place. When the bridges break and the mass are calling for a better place. So you can put quite a lot of saturation on vocals and it sounds really good, I think. So moving on to the compressor. When the bridges break and the mass are calling for a better place. You can hear that's quite a pumpy sound and it doesn't sound so good on vocals, although it did sound quite good on drums. So I'll have another little look through the algorithms. When the bridges break and the mass are calling for a better place. When the bridges break and the mass are calling for a better place. When the bridges break and the mass are calling for a better place. When the bridges break and the mass are calling for a better place. 
So there you go, you can hear that smooth, it doesn't sound like it's pumping at all, which doesn't work so well on the vocals, although it does work well on drums and other rhythmic instruments. And you'll see I haven't really bothered using the mix control either, I didn't really feel it needed it. Something I did find though, was like I was saying with drums, the density control sounds quite good on its own, because it's compressing the signal. And if this control is what I think it is, in that it boosts the top frequencies when it's set to top, and then compresses the whole signal, it's actually exploiting something which I use anyway when I'm producing, and that's that I'll use frequency excitement, which does a very similar thing. So this would work quite well on vocals, and because this is a compressor as well, I probably don't need to use any extra compression on top of this. So let's have a little listen. When the bridges break and the mass are calling for a better place When the bridges break and the mass are calling for a better place when the bridges break and the mass are calling for a better place. When the bridges break and the mass are calling for a better place. So you can hear that subtly it is having an effect on the high end there and it's making it sound a lot crisper to my ears, but I'm going to turn it all the way up just so you can really hear it. When the bridges break and the mass are calling for a better place. When the bridges break and the mass are calling for a better place. And that is definitely subtle but I quite like the sound of it, and it does seem to add some kind of crispness to the vocals. So moving on again, here I've got some electric guitar, which sounds like so. So that's quite a punchy sound in itself. You'll also hear that it's not entirely a tight sound, the dynamics do move around a little bit in it. So let's try putting UBK1 on and just see how that sounds on there. So starting with the headroom and then saturation controls again. So the saturation control adds quite a lot of bite to guitars, which is quite a nice sound as well. And a 50-50 mix gives this electric guitar line a good frequency balance, I think. It's got a lot of bite, now it's also got the punch that it started with, and there's a lot of low end in there too. So moving on to the compression. That one adds quite a lot of punch to it. Um, it's also boosting the low ends up quite a lot though. So I could try just fiddling around with the high pass. I think there's a happy medium. Um, you could hear that when I turn it down, the whole track gets crushed up a lot more, but when I turn it up, it comes to life a bit. However, the low end often does pop up and would need high passing if I was using that. With an electric guitar line, you tend to do that anyway, so it might not be a problem. And just going through these presets again. You can hear that these all have a really, really specific sound to them. You can get some really cool tones even if you've already got a processed electric guitar track like this. And again, just like with the saturation stage, when I was testing this out I felt that the density module added quite a lot of bite to the top end. Whereas the saturation gave quite a lot of top end bite, this gives a lot more bite in the mid-range, so it gives you a good choice of ways to process the guitar here. I think that UBK1 really does well on electric guitar, it sounds a lot better than it does on drums and vocals, and that's not because it sounds bad on drums and vocals, but every single algorithm and module adds something different to electric guitar, whereas on the drums and vocals, only certain modules and algorithms actually add something nice to it. Of course a lot of this is subjective, but this is my personal preference. So finally, I've got an acoustic guitar track here. Mm -hmm. 
So in my testing again, because this is quite a similar instrument to electric guitar in principle, I did find that this sounded great with UBK1 and I will definitely be using it with it. So the saturation stage again gives it a lot of push. You can hear that the saturation is levelling out the acoustic guitar really nicely. There were a couple of moments where it started to seem to distort, and I think that was partially due to me starting to run out of headroom, so I backed off the headroom a bit. And I could balance this quite nicely with the mix control. So because this already gave quite a good push and it's levelled out the acoustic quite nicely, I wouldn't then go on and use compression or the density control. So I'm going to disable this and then move on and just see how these sound. And again, just like with the electric guitar, like I said, I thought it was going to sound great. And again, this is a favourite compressor now for acoustic guitar. That just sounds absolutely brilliant. Every single algorithm adds something different. And I'm not even having to fiddle around with the mix control to get enough punch back in because the compression control gives me so much control over the sound. And again, I'll just go onto the density control so you can have a listen to that as well. So you can hear when I'm enabling and disabling it there, it's adding a lot of bite to the top end, but it is subtle. So I'm feeling like I've really only touched the surface of UBK1 here. There's a lot I can think of that you can do with it. For instance, I didn't really experiment with the compression beyond this range here. Generally in this range, it's sounding quite crushed up and I don't really have a use for that myself, um, but you may find uses for it. And when you get to here, it does start to sound like the compression is being taken off instead of put on harder. So I tended to stick around here because that's where you got the most compression and the most push from it. Also, there's a lot you can do with the headroom control. Obviously, because this isn't an actual hardware unit, there's no way you could blow it up. So you could really crank the headroom control and get some cool distortion effects. Because even with a little bit of clipping, there is a lot of distortion there. So cranking it all the way up will give you some proper overdrive. And it's definitely something worth checking out. So my general opinion of UBK1 is that I love it. I think I definitely prefer it on guitars to drums and vocals. It is very, very useful on drums to get some nice tasty sounds from it, but the algorithms generally were a little bit limited in that only a few of them would work on each type of drum, whereas with the guitars, all of them sounded great in their own way. One of my criticisms of UBK1 is that the metering isn't terribly good. It does force you to use your ears, which is great because in my tutorials, I really try to push the idea of using your ears instead of your eyes. And they do give you some visual feedback in telling you kind of how hard you're compressing something or saturating something but not really beyond just a general idea. They don't tell you that the compressor is taking off three decibels of gain reduction, which is sometimes quite a useful thing to know. This is quite a specialised compressor. It's designed to do some very specific things, and it does those very well. But generally, if you're looking for a transparent compressor, which is just going to compress some vocals and leave them sounding how they were, apart from the dynamics being changed, then you should probably go elsewhere. However, if you want to make some really creative effects, this is an awesome compressor. And it's definitely something at the end of the day just to have in your plug-in box so that you can drop it onto a track and think, right, does this sound good? Yes? No? Shall I keep it? And you may come up with some really cool effects that way. One final thing to say about UBK1 itself 
is that you do need an iLock for the license. And if you don't know what that is, tap it in on Google. Personally, I think iLock's a great thing because if you have a computer crash, you can immediately just install all the plugins you need, plug in your iLock and away you go again. But I know there's a lot of criticism because if you lose your iLock, you've lost your licenses and you'll need to reinstall them to your iLock account. And a lot of manufacturers are starting to move away from it because of that and a number of other user issues. But that's really down to personal preference. I quite like iLock, but a lot of people don't like it and you'll have to decide. UBK1 is available now in AAX, RTAS, VST and AU formats for the Mac and RTAS and VST formats for Windows. And it currently goes for $149, which is about £92. I'll put a link down in the underbar to the Kush Audio website, and they also have a couple of videos up there showing a bit more how to use the plugin. And do remember, if you choose to buy this plugin, you do need an iLock dongle to use it. So do factor that into the cost, as an iLock will set you back another $50, or around about £31. So thanks for watching, I hope you found this video helpful. Remember if you've got any suggestions for future tutorials or reviews, then head over to our Facebook page and leave a comment suggesting them. And as always, please like, comment and subscribe. I'll see you next time.